In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember, that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And grace, mercy, and peace be to you this morning from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, how do you feel about spending your money? There's a lot of different ways you could approach that question. Maybe the first thing you think to yourself, you just want to fire back, what money? I'm a college student, or I'm a college staff and faculty member. When I've sat with couples in marriage counseling, we usually end up talking about how in most relationships, there happens to be a spender and a saver. One who tries to dial back the spending, draw the boundaries around their things, and one who tends to spend a little bit more frivolously. Sometimes a relationship is made up of two spenders, a dangerous combo. Sometimes it's two savers. And then the challenge is trying to convince them to go do some things for themselves, spend a little money. It's okay to do that from time to time. Milton Friedman is an American economist. He won the Nobel Prize in economic sciences in 1976, and he argued that there's really four ways in which we can spend money. He said, you can spend your own money on yourself. When you do that, why then you really watch out what you're doing and you try to get the most for your money. Then you can spend your own money on somebody else. For example, I buy a birthday present for someone, well then I'm not so careful about the content of the present, but I'm very careful about the cost. Then I can spend somebody else's money on myself. And if I spend somebody else's money on myself, then I'm sure going to have a good lunch. Finally, I can spend somebody else's money on somebody else. And if I spend somebody else's money on somebody else, I'm not concerned about how much it is, and I'm not concerned about what I get. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? The difference in how we feel about spending our own wealth versus spending the wealth of another. In our text for today, Jesus tells a parable about a rich man and a man named Lazarus. And in the verses leading up to this, we get the reasons why. He was speaking to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were lovers of money. Jesus had been teaching on the importance of loving and serving God over and above loving money, and these men were ridiculing him for it. They didn't like the fact 
that Jesus was telling them how they should be viewing and spending their wealth. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we really don't like that either. So Jesus tells a story. He talks about this rich man who had plenty of creature comforts. He feasted sumptuously every day. But laid at this rich man's gate was Lazarus, the polar opposite of the rich man. He was a poor man. So poor and so forgotten, in fact, that stray dogs would show him more comfort and care than anyone else, even and especially the rich man. And all the poor man wanted were just a few table scraps to fall from the rich man's table. That would be enough for him. The poor man, Lazarus, he dies. And he's carried away into heaven. The rich man died. And he descended into a hellish prison. Now Lazarus, he has everything. He's face to face with Father Abraham. He made it. While all the rich man hopes for is just a drop of cold water, anything to soothe his anguish. But now there can be no comfort. There's nothing Abraham or Lazarus can do for the rich man, for an impossible gap separates them from each other. His fate is set. He's left to suffer. While Lazarus finally gets to rest and celebrate. You've got to admit, it's not a bad end to a parable. The selfish, greedy, wealthy rich man finally got what was coming to him. He deserved to go to that terrible place, never caring for anyone but himself. And poor Lazarus, for once he finally got to experience something good in his life after death. I think most people in our world today would be good with that understanding. Selfish man suffers. Needy man is satisfied. But this parable from Jesus, it cuts a bit deeper than that. There might be some reasons that rich man doesn't get a name and Lazarus does. And perhaps one of them is that those listening to Jesus and his parable, they're not meant to identify with Lazarus, but to check their own lives through the lens of the rich man. There's a website that I heard about recently. I wonder if any of you have too. It's called Spend Bill Gates Money. Have you heard about this? You should Google that sometime. It's this website that lets you start with $90 billion and it gives you all kinds of things that you can spend Bill Gates' net worth on, a la carte. You can buy all 32 NFL teams and still have $16.4 billion left over. And with the leftovers, you could buy 8.2 billion Big Mac sandwiches. Honestly, it's kind of absurd and a fun way to kill five minutes. Because it's frivolous. It doesn't really matter. Because Bill Gates' wealth is not mine to spend. Jesus' concern is on how we're using what God our Father has entrusted to each and every one of us. Do our wealth and our blessings from God exist to simply make my life more comfortable? Are they a measure of my own personal success and status? Are we using our wealth and our status and our success to justify ourselves before others? Maybe it's time for a heart check. Because some of this wealth that the world says is so great, things that are supposed to make my life so amazing and enjoyable, Jesus says they might leave me feeling unsatisfied, empty and hollow. Jesus says that if I chase after such things, I'll end up becoming a slave to them. Jesus says that some of these things might even become a thing of disgrace and disgust before our God. Did you notice that the rich man, when he ends up in that place of torment, he's not really worried about his stuff anymore, is he? He's worried about his own need. And he's worried about the needs of those he loves. 
It's so easy for the material things of this world to block us and distract us from that core purpose for which we're here. And we're here to love God. A God who has so lavishly loved each and every one of us and we're here to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's so easy to hold on to whatever wealth we think we have to become puffed up in our own pride and to refuse to repent, to admit that God has the better way and refuse to admit that so often I would rather choose my own path over his. But thank God. Thank God that he has given us the ultimate message and miracle that leads us all back to repentance. And it's never too late. He's given us the culmination of Moses and all the prophets, the most convincing news that the world could ever hear, that while we were still greedy, while we were selfish and comfortable in our own sin, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That eternal chasm that separated us from belonging to God, Jesus came and he stood in that gap. The perfect God-man suffers and dies on a cross so that all can be satisfied. Jesus really is the best spender and saver, isn't he? He spent all his time here on earth trying to show an indifferent world that in him there is an abundance of life. In him, we are enough, fully satisfied. If only we would believe, if only we would taste and see that the Lord is good. He spent it all to save us. And now we get to spend his wealth on others. The eternal riches of forgiveness, the blessings that we've received so freely, we get to freely give and share. All because better than any one of us ever could, Jesus saw himself through the lens of the rich man. He took his place. He went to the other side of the chasm to hunger and thirst, all so that we could be filled, that we might become the righteousness of our God. In Jesus' name, amen.